Well, I'm not an old man. I'm a 73-year-old man. A 73-year-old, yes. It's a period of grace, without a doubt. I would much rather have been in one long-term relationship. Who wouldn't? But um, what I am aware of is I was raised in a house. uh, As a small child, my nightmare was claustrophobia. It was a very closed household. It didn't involve the outside world very much. And I mean, it's also their own past. My, you know, my father had been raised, raised in a tenement where everybody's living really close together and very poor in Glasgow. And it may be from him that he got this thing of don't tell your neighbors your business. Mm. I, don't, I don't know where that came from, but he had that. And I, anyway, I found that I found that relationship very claustrophobic, and knew I didn't want it. My mother was, in many ways, an admirable person, but she wasn't a good mother. And um, in what, in what way? Um, she was really uninterested in religion, mm. and emotionally, she was a bit Asperger's, mm. and so. I didn't actually know what a good woman looked like, so I focused on things like legs and sexiness. Um, that's my analysis yeah. of why I'm single. But I mean, I've also yeah. had, you know, several women with big daddy problems. Mm. Um, so I suppose, you know, the wounded attract the wounded. Uh, who knows if anybody's actually whole. My true, father was true. a very kind man, yeah. and my grandfather was a very kind man. And so I think, uh, certainly as I got older, being kind came very naturally to me. Mm. And um, yeah, I've, I've, always, I've always liked children, well, not always, but I've usually liked children as equals. Mm. And dogs, <laughs> my, both of my blood sons were accidental and it was in effect a shotgun relationship. It started like that. Um, the, other, the other boys, uh, T- Teo, okay, I don't want a relationship with the woman, but I'm not going to walk out on this kid that, you know, we're like that. So that, that seemed quite a normal thing to do. And then, as you know, the Joel one, um, you know, he was an orphan, basically. Mm. Um, yeah, actually, if I'm, if I'm rugged with myself, I feel an enormous grace to have had the opportunity of what I did with Joel. I feel really lucky mm. to have been mm. in his life. Some grandchildren in need and <coughs> are a bit more wary. <laughs> yeah, I'm older, I'm in another country. Um, I mean, I had thought, Jake and I talked, my eldest son and I talked about whether the troubled 16-year-old American grandson whose dad has, you know, killed himself with alcohol um, and he's in a difficult place. You know, we, we, we said we would bring him over to England, but I fucking didn't mm. want to. You know? mm. Not because I don't love him, but because I really didn't want to take on a troubled 16-year-old. Somebody, some part along the line, told me the thing about grief. They said, imagine a, a cube box, and inside the box is a red rubber ball. And when the terrible thing happens, the ball fits the box exactly and touches mm. on each side. And when the ball touches on, each, on any side, you get this stab of pain. And over years, that bowl gets smaller and smaller. But every now and again, like in this moment, it yeah. touches the side yeah. and I get the beginning of tears, mm. the stabbing in the chest, yeah. the back of the neck. The well, side. Look, I ran away from a posh boarding school when I was very young. Um, I had a short period at home in which I was dysfunctional and went out at four in the morning and stole cars to drive around. I couldn't stand it at home, claustrophobia. I was, I think by about 15 and a half, I was homeless in London, sleeping on park benches, 
queuing up at a newspaper office at 11 in the morning to get taken with a lot of other people in vans and dumped at intersections in the city of London where you'd shout the evening news. And then crawling up from that, you know, to being a fucking bus conductor in Halifax, working on a fishing boat, everything hand to mouth, and you don't stop. Then it was, I was in so in survival mode, I was just throwing myself. It took me 24 hours a day to survive until I became a hippie. Then there was a heavy, heavy medication with the weed and the other things. And, but then enormous enjoyment in that period, enormous sense of relief. And then of course the, the wedding. And um, by then I was used to, um, I think I think all that sort of, guerrilla existence days in my teens um, put, to, put me in mind of you get on with things. But I was always, I was very literate and I always read novels and some non-fiction, but non-fiction in those days wasn't very interesting. Okay, there's memory, there's analysis of memory and the result of you integrating those things. The result of me integrating those things is I become very forgiving of myself. That there's no point in occasionally, I, you know, I feel grief and no, I could have done different with William, but I didn't know how to. But on the whole, I think my reflection, I'm quite kind with myself in that you know, because I've got this belief <laughs> or this doubt that we have any willpower at all. I think of us as big soft machines, computers that just process and out comes a result. And when I look back on my life, I feel kindly towards the person that I was. And I know the interesting thing about the homeless time is it sounds absolutely awful, but it was just like living in a war. So it was absolute survival. So you just got on with everything and you didn't feel sorry for yourself. You just got on with everything. And because of the posh education, I knew I wasn't going to end up like this. It never crossed my mind. Mm. You know, I, you know <laughs> if I'd had a better upbringing, you know, a cozier mum, I wouldn't be who I am. Yeah. All right. You're done. Yeah. Okay. No, I could talk for hours.